Business Brain, the Entrepreneur's Podcast, episode 411 for Wednesday, December 21st, 2022. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Business Brain here at businessbrain.show. We are the show where we use our business brains every week, every day. We talk about how we use them to better our businesses, better our lives, all those things. We're also really happy to have Shopify on board as a sponsor. Visit shopify.com slash SBS. That's where you're going to go to get your 14 day trial and full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. We'll talk more in depth about that in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Lafayette, California, I'm Shannon Jean. I always, doing, man? I'm good. I always say for now here in Durham, New Hampshire, like later uh, in the episode, I'm going to be somewhere else. I'm not. <laughs> it's a moving target. Yeah, right. I'm not. I, I'm not. Yeah. I have no plans to. I don't. I can't predict the well, future, but I can tell you what my yes. Plans I heard are. A, a new phrase a couple of days ago that I thought was pretty interesting because we always embrace change on this show, and and the, that phrase was everything is moving and or yeah, everything is moving and movement is everything. Ah. Yeah, I like that. Sure. It's just constantly moving and doing this kind of thing. So it's one of those, well, those sort of phrases that's self evident about itself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Hey, yeah. yeah that's good. Um, Fred Franzia is has there's an interesting story about this guy. Yeah, you you might <laughs> you might not know his name, folks, but you might know about Two Buck Chuck if you've ever been to Trader Joe's, uh, because that's the the brand that or the brand name that we, the public, gave to their inexpensive wine that's uh that's pretty good, at least to my to my very uncultured it's taste buds. And I don't live in sold over a yeah, sold over a billion bottles. Yeah. Yeah. With a B. Yeah. With a B. I know it's crazy. Um it is. It, but it's a fascinating story uh about how he created this brand and this business really i mean it, it, you know i i think they say he makes over 100 million bucks a year which i certainly i believe um yeah they started what i love about this guy yeah it, it, it is i i feel uh you know i've always felt like an outsider it's one of the reasons i started my first business and this kind of stuff uh and this guy is like the consummate outsider you know he started it he thought the wine industry was you know uh very pretentious and all this kind of stuff. A lot of it was just BS and marketing. And so he came into it with a different, uh, a different outlook to say the least. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Um, th because yeah, he came from a, a wine family. I think his grandfather started Franzia wine and, and you can find their boxes of wine around, right? Um, but, <laughs> you can, but it's not theirs anymore. I think back in the early seventies, yeah. uh, Fred's, uh, father, so, so the the middle generation there between the grandfather and and the two buck Chuck guy sold that business to actually to the Coca Cola uh, company. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and and there was an interesting little thing there that happened because he was pissed that he lost control of his family's name. Which you know, I mean, when you sell the business, if the business has your name, that's what's going to happen. It's bet that'd be like me being pissed that I no longer have control of the brand name, the Mac Observer, right? Which, oh, by the way, yes, I can yes, finally that. share that it sold again, uh, very recently. That's that's, a, that's fascinating. It, it uh, I how. I am happy. I am so happy it sold again. The guy who bought it from us, it, it, things um, outside of the business, sort of uh, throughout the year became very distracting for him. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, but uh, when he called me and told me he didn't have the time to run the business anymore or to, to grow the business the way he wanted to, he didn't say he didn't have time to run it, but he, he didn't, you know, he didn't have the time to really spend on it the way he wanted to. I thought, Oh no, like, okay. I, the last thing I want to hear about is yeah, this business yeah. dying, you know? And, uh, sure. and then, and then he told your, me your transaction was done by that. Oh time, yeah. Correct? Yeah. I was out yeah. of it. This you is just an emotional attachment to, okay. to he that. He wasn't making payments or nope. anything like that. Nope. at that time. Okay. It was all okay. paid up front. Everything was, was good to, yeah, that, that part was fine. I just didn't want to see it close down, you, you yeah. know? And, sure. and he told me that, you know, serendipity struck, this guy, Radu Tirsina, who runs a site called Windows Report, uh, had come to me, I think the first time I met him was 11 years ago, 
And he wanted to write for us at the Mac Observer that for whatever reason that didn't work out. I can't even remember why that didn't happen because that 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 easily could have. And then about five years later, he started and and three times since had come to me about buying the site. He couldn't we couldn't make the deal happen. He politely says in public that that he didn't have the money to do it, which may or may not be true. I think I also wasn't in a mindset of of selling the business yeah, you weren't ready. time. I wasn't ready. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. It didn't even right. make sense yep. to me that this could be possible. Uh, but he did come around again and obviously came to the, the, you know, the, the person that bought it from us and, um, and wound up striking a deal and it's in great hands now. So I'm, I'm really stoked. So, uh, that was a, a detour, but, um, I, I figured it was a good one to have. So, cause I know, yeah. I know people are going to ask me about it. Like l- literally the day that we're recording this is the day the press release came out. So I'm, I'm actually able to talk about this now, which I'm, I'm glad. So, uh, Absolutely. and I'm really happy about it. Um, the, um, Back to Fred Franzia. So I'm, I'm, uh, he, he, it says, um, he, his dad started a new uh, winery called Bronco Wine, and it started as a wholesaler, but he wanted to sell his own brands, cheap wine to higher class folks, right? To cheap wine to yuppies was, was the whole idea with this Bronco wine company. But there was a challenge. Um, the, uh, Central Valley, I guess, in California. Uh, which- yeah, so it, Central Valley is is the breadbasket of California. Most vegetables and fruits, uh, I mean, it, it produces just a massive amount of food for the whole country here in California. And the the soil is really, really good. And that sounds great, but for wine, it's not so great. Yeah, what you kind of want, want it to be dry, the, right? Yeah, dry, rocky you know, the, the vines are a little more stressed out. They produce better fruit. And uh, as you can imagine, it's much more expensive to grow wine in Napa Valley than it is down in the Central Valley in Fresno and Turlock and these areas that are inland. But the problem is also it gets super hot down okay. in, the, in the Central Valley. So it doesn't produce as, well, it's subjective, of course, but it, of it doesn't course. produce the type type of grapes that the Napa Valley areas uh, do with their kind of more uh, mild climate, if you will. Got it. But there's a way around that. (laughs) There was. Well, yeah. In in 1986, they made a rule that, uh, that said you couldn't do what they wound up doing, but, or they made a, made a rule that pre that new businesses couldn't do what they were about to do. But since their business, they'd started it in like 74 after they sold the other one, they were fine. A wine could say that it was cellared and bottled in Napa Valley, even if the uh, the contents of those bottles were, you know, the far less Not superior yeah. Central Valley wine or, or from anywhere. Right. Yes. Because it was it, in, in I mean, it was true. You, you know, they, they probably moved it to Napa Valley, put it in the, you know, the cellar, the warehouse, if you will. And, and the bottling plant was in, was there. Yeah. So, but uh, it's, it's an interesting <clears throat> way to present it. It's all marketing, right? It's all marketing, right? And uh, yeah, yeah. and so he he bought a bunch of different. He he did this and started making money. Bought a couple of different vineyards, I guess, and or a different a couple of different brands, and uh, and wound up um, buying. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to make sure I get this right. Uh, he he encountered a guy named Charles Shaw, which is where the two buck Chuck name comes from. And he, um, he was a West point grad Stanford MBA and was obsessed with winemaking, uh, after like some encounter in Paris or whatever, it probably involves a, a woman or something. Right. Cause that's how those things go, you know? Uh, and, and he, he got obsessed and he did this, but, uh, he really wanted like this, this, wine thing right like he he wanted this this classic california wine and um yeah he's he's, he's selling a bottle of wine for you know 50, 50 bucks, bucks or something back yeah. back in you know in the 70s so uh, you know think about it yeah um, or, the, or the early 80s it was it was pretty expensive yeah, but he created this this high brand you know a uh, high dollar brand of wine this charles shaw did and uh and he was doing a lot of money, like he was doing a lot of business. I, I think they were said in the mid eighties, he was doing like 2 million a year, but there was a crop accident and a divorce. And 
Then he went bankrupt. $3 million yeah. in debt by 1992. And so Fred Franzia acquired the Charles Shaw winery out of bankruptcy a few years later. He paid $27,000 for it. And, uh, and, and he did nothing with it. He sat on it for 10 years. And, and, but this is like, this is where opportunity knocks, right? Like he just, he thought, okay, 27 grand, like, okay, great. Like that's, you know, short money even then it's shorter money now, but you know, even then he, he could afford it. He grabbed it. There was a, a, another opportunity happened. Uh, an oversupply of grapes started building up. The non-industry folks got into the wine game and the, uh, the vineyard acreage jumped 24% in the, in that 10 year period that he owned, uh, Charles Shaw. And so he, uh, th- as they, as they describe it, he shorted the market by building a almost hundred thousand square foot bottling plant and just waited for prices to crash. So he didn't have the wine or even enough grapes to, 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 you know, to make the wine, but he bought a bottling plant when no one wanted to buy one or built one, uh, when no one wanted to do that because the industry was kind of falling in the wrong direction. He stopped producing his wine. Fred Franzia did letting all of his storage tanks, like 450 of them sit idle. And then the wine market blew up. Oversupplied wineries were forced to offload their inventory. And he bought quality wine for 50 cent on the gallon, not versus a dollar a gallon versus the previous market rate of $10 a gallon. And now he had this bottling facility ready to roll, producing it out of the gate. It could produce 18 million cases a year, which for perspective is twice the entire capacity of the, the Napa region. And so it was making wine 24 seven. And he decided to bring that Charles Shaw brand that he'd bought for 27 K out of retirement and uh, put a logo on it and was like, okay, now I just need to find a place to sell it. And he found Trader Joe's yep. and that's it's where brilliant. it was brilliant. Yeah. So he, he was able to supply cheap wine to Trader Joe's good wine. People, I, like I said, I, I like that, that, uh, Charles Shaw wine that you can get at Trader Joe's now. I mean, it's a red blend or whatever. It's a, I think a white yeah. blend too, or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's brilliant. I just, it's a great story. I, I love, again, I love that he's outsider that comes in and he's a disruptor, right? Uh, and, and, you know, they've sold over a, a billion, you know, not a billion dollars, a billion bottles yeah. of, uh, you know, of this. And, and it's and not two bucks like, anymore. It's now six bucks, but it's still, it it's is. Still cheap. It's, yeah, uh, I, I bought a bottle last week. It was five ninety nine. That's funny. I think so. Yeah. 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 That's, that's wild. And what I, what I love too is, is some of the ways that, uh, he was able to, you know, take advantage of things like, you know, the dating. So, okay, I can call this a Napa wine, even though, you know, the, the grapes are coming from the central Valley. Uh, and I, I love that, that, you know, he, he's, he's like Apple. I'm going to control all aspects of it. I'm going to control the grapes. I'm going to, I'm going to bottle it. I'm going to distribute it. I'm going to, you know, uh, handle the trucking and also things are that maybe you wouldn't even think about it. They use a thinner glass, uh, for the bottles, so they can get more bottles on a truck. So they ship, you know, 1,400 or so bottles versus 1,200 to Amazing. help get the shipping costs down. So I love it. Yeah, I, lo- I, I love this whole story. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing. If, you know, and, and it's just thinking about a, an industry, like what you could do for your business to shake things up and how could you do things, you know, that just go run counter to this concept. Like on the, the wine thing, you know, forever it was oh it's pretentious and we've got to have this very well, high that, end this that's it that. finding that pretentious business and coming in with an unpretentious yeah. mindset like to me that's the yeah. part that i mean i like a lot of aspects of this don't, don't get me wrong me too. But that's the one that that really enamored me to this was this is a pretentious business and there's high margins right you, you know and I, I mean i get it that land is is not a, inexpensive and uh, you know, all of that stuff there, there are high, high costs, but there are high margins in the wine business, right? You know, the people, yeah. people can sell a couple hundred cases a year and, and feed their families. Like that's definitely high margin. It's, you know, it's not, yeah. not usually how things work. And he saw that and said, well, wait a minute. If I, I can, 
I can like come in and do the process the right way and set up the, the, the logistics of the business in a way that can scale. And I can take some high margins, but also sell it for way less than everybody else's and still get right. some high margins because the public idea is that wine is more expensive than it should be. It, it, it not, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Not, not that people think it's more expensive than it should be, but people are used to the prices where wine is, even though it shouldn't be that high. People are yeah. okay with it. So if you and, cut it in half, like, or less, it's like, sure. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, he, he saw that all these, you know, a lot of, a lot of, wealthy entrepreneurs or people like he, he called them Stanford graduates that were coming in and buying wineries and didn't know what they were doing. It reminds me, you know, a couple of years ago we had, uh, or a few years ago, Tony Biaggi on the show and we'll link it in the notes. He's a winemaker yeah. and that is his specialty. He would, you know, I met him at a, at a dinner one time or one evening and then asked him to come on the show. And he, he said almost the exact same thing. He's like, there's a lot of wealthy at, at this time. It was, it was a lot of tech, tech guys uh, that, you know, had a ton of money, thought they could come in and use their cash and build a great winery. He's like, well, yeah, you can build a beautiful building and do all this kind of stuff. And they're good at the marketing, but, you know, creating a wine that's, that's tastes great is a different story altogether. And so his whole business was he would hi get hired. He'd go in, consult, find a winemaker, work with that winemaker for a couple of years to really turn around these wineries. It's a fascinating uh, story. I'd recommend you go listen to it at businessbrain.show. You'll find the link. You know, the one thing I love about open mic nights, like comedy nights, is how they make it possible for anyone to step up and try stand-up. The thing I love about our sponsor, Shopify, is how it's the all-in-one commerce platform that makes it simple for anyone to step up to start, run, and grow a successful business. That's the sound of a new sale happening on Shopify, and that's a sound we like to hear. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere. With Shopify, you'll create an online store in your vibe, discover new customers, and grow the following that keeps them coming back. Shopify has all the sales channels sorted so your business keeps growing. From an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even across your social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks to 24-7 support and free libraries full of educational content, Shopify's got you every step of the way. That's why every minute new sellers around the world hear that sound when they make their first sale with Shopify. And you will too, just like we have here. Shannon and I, we've used Shopify with various things because Shopify makes it so easy and easy. They do it right because they know what they're doing with this stuff. You do your stuff. They do their stuff. It's a match made together. It's perfect. When you're ready to launch your thing into the spotlight, do it with Shopify, the commerce platform backing millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. Go on, try Shopify for free and start selling anywhere. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash SBS, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash SBS to start selling online today. Shopify.com slash SBS. And our thanks to Shopify for sponsoring this episode. All right. Uh, I know you folks have heard a bunch about chat GPT. If you are, if you haven't, what this is, is it is the latest iteration from the open AI folks. Uh, they have built a transformative model uh, a, a, a transformative AI model, which means you just, they fed it a bunch of data, like a crap ton of data. But what's cool about the way they fed it, this data is it doesn't have to be structured in any way. Uh, it just has to be data. And the engine itself will go through and find ways to relate all of this data together. So they, they pumped in a ton of stuff up through 2021 into this model. And it's the third version that they've put out. The, the difference and the reason you're hearing as much about it and the reason we're talking about it here is it's the first time that the public gets to interact with this thing. And so, yeah, it, and, it, and it's conversational, right? That, right to well, me, that was the yeah the big deal when I started using it. Yeah. And, and previous incarnations have been as well. You just couldn't, you couldn't, you and I couldn't use them. We had to apply for a, like a, a per yeah. permit and a login and all that stuff. And it was only for certain people. And now they they're running a huge 
uh, you know, server farm to do this. I, I think it costs them like two cents a query, which I know it doesn't seem like much, but it really is. There's oh, millions yeah. of users. Yeah. But they really are kind of pushing it out there. It's free for now. It may or may not remain that way. But yes, it's conversational, which is the transformative part because you can type in a query into, you go to chat.openai.com, you type in a query and, and, and it will give you an answer. And the query can be anything you want to ask. It could be, uh, you know, I'm having a problem with someone in my life and I'm, uh, you know, I'm not sure how to approach it. And it will give you that answer. People, there are people using this for therapy, but, or it could yeah. be write me a song based on, uh, you know, the, the misunderstood generation X and make sure in the song you use the phrase intergenerational sandwich, right? And it yeah, will go and amazing. write, write you lyrics, but then you could say, rewrite the first verse and make it from the perspective of a uh, millennial, it, you know, and it will it's, it's thread it, right? You yeah. can say, okay, now adjust this or yeah. say it this way. Yeah, it's and incredible. Th that's the transformative part is you get to tell it to transform itself. And it's, it's not perfect. Uh, you can have it do math problems. There are people out there that say that some of the math answers that it comes up with look very confident and yet are very wrong. Uh, hmm. So it's going to get things wrong because it's not taught by humans it is just trained by information that has been slurped in and, and so and it's not con it's not connected to the internet correct it's not getting current it, information that's right yes they they upload it and it's there uh and but you the actually data ask source, a question or, the data source isn't yeah. connected to the internet uh, the correct. interface You're doing is it very via much a web yes. browser yes, yes. yeah but yeah. it'll tell you if you ask a question it'll say oh i don't have that because i'm not connected to the internet and you know but the the reason I wanted to talk about it, we we that we wanted to bring it up is is it's an amazing, it's definitely a fundamentally uh, new way, a new piece of technology that all of us are going to use, and all small business owners should be looking at this. How AI is going to help you uh, get your get the word out about your business, solve problems. I mean, we've all probably dealt with those chat you know, bots trying to do customer service. This is incredibly uh, exponentially better. Oh yeah. In the sense and this of will interaction change interaction with you. This will change yeah. customer service. Cause one of the, yes. one of the uses for this is to take your businesses like FAQ. And maybe if you've saved all of your customer service responses in, in say yes. like a fresh desk or something, right. Slurp all that data in. And now when someone new comes in and asks a question, it can aggregate and, and sift through all of that, all of your very specific to your business data and provide answers that are likely helpful. And it could learn from itself too, as it goes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, and, and it will, you know, I've heard a lot of people say it, one of the first things most people say is, Oh my gosh, this is going to put Google out of business. Right. Because it, it's, uh, well, it, you know, it's a search different. engine. Well, yeah. no, if once yeah. you can get the answers you need about everything from an engine like this, you will never use a, a traditional search engine again. How, and that's true. I, I think that that is, yeah, a, that is a fact, but this is not going to put Google out of business because this whole thing exists from based on in part, at least uh, a paper Google published a number of years ago about their Lambda, L-A-M-D-A yes. service. It's not public, right? Which yeah. is not public. It is exactly this kind of transformative AI. That was the first place it was really described was when Google described it. And Google says their engine is even better than this, which of course is what Google would say. But I, I don't have reason to not believe them because they're Google. They know that this is going to replace search and they know they don't want to be out of business. So it stands to reason that. Uh, that they're already working on this. And, and they, of course they, they are. So, but it, it's really, yeah, for your business right now, especially if you're not using this, anytime you have a question you can't answer you, that you are putting yourself and your business at a disadvantage. Talk about using Correct. your business brain. I, I round yeah. up with um, a, a, a very minor, everything's fine. Very minor legal <laughs> scenario. And I, I asked a, a couple of friends about it. It's with a, a business I have. And, and it was like, oh, okay, well, I'm okay. I'm in this little minor pickle. I can probably navigate my own way through it, but 
always like to ask for the help of experts because I'm not an expert in the, the law. There, there's, there's nuance as to how the law works. They, guess what? I don't know. Of course I don't know. Uh, and so I started asking some you know, attorney friends around. I didn't want to pay yet for legal advice, although I, I'm, I may choose to do that. And, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, obviously. And, uh, and so one of them sort of gave me a, that, that specializes in this sort of area of things. He gave me enough about the, this, the, the, the way things work in this particular realm of the law. And I'm being vague here for, for reasons that hopefully I'll be able to share down the road and, and have a lesson uh, about, but, uh, for now, no, but he, he, you know, he had some specific experience and he explained a couple of the, the mechanics of the way things might work to me. And that was helpful. And that was helpful enough for me to then go to, to chat GPT and say, OK, please draft a response about this issue. And I put specifics in and I know you're not supposed to do that with chat GPT because it's it's public data. And I probably shouldn't be sharing, you, you know, legal strategies <laughs> with a public engine. But the fact that I was willing to throw that away and just use it anyway should probably tell you a lot about how uh, we humans value, or at least me, this particular human, values convenience versus values privacy, uh, which is an interesting thing. And, and the fact that millions of people are using ChatGPT for their legal needs and therapy and all of that, it, it speaks to this point. But I put it in. I said, you, you do it this way. And, uh, it, you know, draft me a response. And it did. And then I said, oh, you know, the people that, that, uh, that, I'm, that uh, you know, are quote unquote on the other side of this, I hate to I hate thinking of it that way. But, you know, they, they had cited some precedent or something, you, you know, whatever. And it was like, okay, oh, actually uh, amend that with references to this precedent. And I was like, okay. And, and like these responses are coming back as quickly as I am talking to you about them like they are just right up and so i was like wow this looks really good to me but does it hold any water so i sent it back to my friend the attorney and he's like oh my god this changes everything he's like this is yeah. exactly he's like you just had it, this is like what i would expect a legal assistant to draft he's like there's some things we should change here he's like but do you understand how much money you just saved yourself if you brought this to an attorney you saved yourself hundreds of dollars in doing the draft yourself. A law office should start using this. And, and when he said that, that was the point where it was like, okay, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm going to pat myself on the back for thinking to use chat GPT to not hire another, you know, not hire an attorney or not pay an attorney as much. Right. So, and that's great. But the attorney should be using chat GPT to, expedite this process because instead of having a, a legal assistant you know spend hours drafting something this thing did it with essentially the prompt from the from the attorney in 10 seconds yeah it, was, it, was, it blew my mind same uh, because i'd seen some you know examples of it and i've been playing around with it and then when you showed me your example it's like oh wow and and i made the comment there are people that are going to be really good at using this uh, chat GPT or whatever other type yep. of open AI comes along. Just like there are people that are really good at using Google. And on the flip side, there are people that are not very good at using Google to find things. Um, and they're probably the folks asking you questions all the time. And and, and then just the same with this. The, the key thing is it's early. And here this is your opportunity. What yep. it reminds me of many, many years ago, I was on the phone with a, with a, colleague of mine who was just killing it selling this was a time where you bought you actually bought operating system software on a disc it was the yeah. glory days the, 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 yeah 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 the know, progress bar days yeah, yeah. It, was, it was wonderful <laughs> uh, and he was just killing it and i couldn't figure out i was like how are you doing it how are you selling so many of these and he's like okay first he wouldn't tell me and then like a little more cajoling and uh i started talking with him more you know we might have had gone out to dinner and finally he says okay i'm gonna I'm going to tell you something that's new and nope, not very many people know about it. And it's called AdWords. I'm all, AdWords? What the hell is that? And basically it was uh, back uh, just uh, when Google started selling advertisements on their search engine. And I went and I looked and, you know, it was very 
it was just reminded me of ChatGPT. There was not much to it. It wasn't very sophisticated. I could yeah. figure out on my own and I could pay the minimum bid because you were bidding on keywords was a nickel. All right. And I could pay a nickel to get those customers to me. And it, it changed my whole business dramatically overnight when I started using it. Now, you know, those keywords cost you like five bucks, but at a nickel, <laughs> you know, you could, it, it, it changed everything. I feel like this chat and the open AI, this is at that same stage. And so you should tune yourself, open your uh, mind up to this, this framework of how AI is going to interact with your business, no matter how small you may be, you may yes. be by yourself. We just did an episode of a, you know, somebody asking, uh, I'm, I'm not quite ready to hire my first employee, but, uh, you know, eventually you'll be able to use some a service like this and maybe you won't need to hire that employee for another six months or a year because you've got a stopgap that can help you and help manage things, your schedule, your, I mean, these things are interactive where it's not just spitting out an answer. It's then it gets more data and it comes back and gives more. It, it, it's, in, it's incredible. It's incredible. No, I, yeah. I think you're, 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 you're spot on here. Our, my advice, which I think is our advice to you and to, and to ourselves, because this is a business brain where, you know, <laughs> it just goes, we basically tell you the advice that we're, we're giving to ourselves, which is, yeah. Spend some time with this. Just be stupid with it. Go sit down. Yes. You know, if if maybe you want to have a glass of two buck chuck with you, maybe you want to have a glass of seltzer, whatever it is, sit on the couch, not in, um, don't do this in your work mode, right? Do this in your couch mode, laptop on your, on your lap, or you can do this on your phone too. It totally works on your phone. It's chat.openai.com. The link's in the yep. show notes at businessshow.co and just play with it. Ask it stupid questions. It doesn't matter I, yeah. what you ask it. You just want to learn how to use it. And there will be others. This one might go away very soon. We don't know. Uh, it's being provided for free. But you get to experiment for free right now. Because if down the road, a query costs you 50 cents, well, that's still super inexpensive, especially if you're making your queries valuable. But right now, you get to learn how to make your queries valuable how to yeah, engage with key. this thing. Yes. And right now, you if you're listening to this, chances are if you figured out how to listen to podcasts, you're probably pretty good with Google, right? And and you didn't start out good with Google. You got there by learning, right? And yeah. and and so you you now, unless you already know, you are a beginner with Chat GPT, totally fine. Go in with beginner's mind, play, be a child with it, be stupid, ask it dumb questions, learn and iterate. Remember that it remembers what it just told you in that session. If you if you leave and come back, I think the session is wiped out. But uh, but sure. just yeah, you know, experiment right. with that part of it, especially because that's where it really is valuable. Is saying, okay, yes, what you just said is good, but rewrite that, or I, I need it from a different angle. Or you got to factor this. I forgot factor this thing in. It's amazing. So yeah, yeah I mean, I, I I'm doing exactly that, trying to experiment with it because what I realized when I read the way you had phrased your legal question, I was like, oh, I'm totally missing it, <laughs> you know, yeah. because I'm, I'm not thinking that it's sophisticated as it is. And so I, I changed my whole framework and I asked it some technical questions of an issue that I'm having on my computer. And then I asked it some questions about hunting, you know, just, just to kind of yeah. get the, and it came back with very succinct and uh, definitive, you know, suggestions and, and ways to phrase things. It, it, it's amazing. I, I can't put too much, too fine a point on it. No, you it's, need to start I, experiment, experiment with it now. And it will write you code. Uh, it like, yeah, I, I, the other day we had uh, a project that we're working on. We needed to tweak the configuration of our Nginx web server. And we had already done it. Like we got there. And then I said to my, one of my business partners, Ryan, I was like, man, we should have used chat GPT for this. And he was like, oh, let's do it. And so we did. And it wrote a similar configuration file to the one that we painstakingly crafted by looking at like Stack Overflow. And But, you know, Stack Overflow doesn't have the answer for what I want. It has answers for what other people wanted that they shared. And, yeah. and I had to extrapolate, we had to extrapolate how to do that. With this, it wrote me the code and it put it in a little code block to make it easy to copy. Then I had it write a PHP script. I told it what I wanted the script to do and it wrote it. And it was correct. It's freaking amazing. It's awesome. It's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. 
Hey, this is this the is uh, this is the last episode we're doing this year. Yeah, we're taking next week off from between yeah. Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. We spend time with family and uh, use Chat, chat GPT. GPT. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, instead That's of listening cool. to the show, ask Chat GPT what you might be able to have learned from Business Brain if there were an episode this week. And who knows? Maybe uh, maybe yeah. it'll tell you. I don't know. I don't know. There are some great episodes up at business show uh, or businessbrain.show all about things you should do end of year. And if you if you go up to uh, the website, search that keyword set end of year, and you'll find three or four episodes we've done over the years. I'd love for you to go listen to those. And uh, we didn't do another one this year because we've already done it a bunch of times. But go up and listen. You'll get some tips on things and that are important to do before the 31st. Yeah. And, uh, and hey, let us know. Feedback at businessbrain.show. Share your chat GPT screenshots with us. We'd love to see how you're oh, yeah. phrasing things. Have a good time. Enjoy uh, your holidays here and uh, keep living that charm life.